Hello and welcome to Demystifying Archival Projects, a session in our preservation workshop series. My name is Katherine Whalen. I am the Richardson Sloan Special Collections Supervisor. Today I will be sharing information about the archival products that we use and that you can use for your own collections, clarifying some def definitions of terms relating to these items, recommending types of enclosures for basic types of material, and providing a list of vendors who sell these products. And so we will hop in and start our, that conversation. So what does archival mean? The term archival typically means is typically applied to storage materials used to house a variety of different and diverse material formats, ranging from paper, um, photographs, so those are on a variety of um, mounting, so it can be glass, metal, paper itself, um, even plastics, um, maps that are in a variety of formats, arch architectural drawings, and then a variety of other items and that one wishes to preserve permanently. So these materials are essentially the the window dressing for the for the items. So the things that you'll first encounter when you're um, going to use an item in a special collections, in a library, in a museum, places like that. And so this is a non-technical term used by professional librarians, archivists, curators, and those working in related fields. It implies to a set of characteristics associated with these materials. But when one is looking for storage materials, it is important to evaluate specific characteristics of each product and choose the most appropriate one for the type of item or collection one is wanting to house. And so from the Society of American Archivists, the term archival is described as having enduring value, permanent. And so that's um, just meaning lasting. Um, durable, lacking inherent vice, long lived, lived, um, not causing degradation, following accepted standards that ensure maximum longevity. Another term that I think I prefer when describing these types of materials is archival quality. The term is defined by SAA as resistant to de deterioration or loss of quality, allowing for life expectancy, long life expectancy when kept in controlled conditions and not causing harm or reduced life expectancy. So those are all in reference to the actual materials that these items are housing. So um, they're not trying, they're to prevent a shortened life expectancy. So it's supposed to prolong um, the existence of the materials that it's housing. Um, in addition to these, the use of ter the term archival and archival quality, um, another term that one might come across when looking at specific materials is permanence. And so you really should um, get to know this word because it just means inherent stability of the material that allows it to res resist degradation over time. And so within the field, it's really important that there are some materials that all materials will degrade, um, decay over time. That's just what natural products do over time. Um, but we can help slow those processes and to mitigate the changes in the chemical comp composition of the materials, things like that, um, to make their lives longer. So for example, you have a newspaper article, newspapers are very, are very acidic, and so you want to preserve that as long as possible. So you um, place the piece of paper in a buffered sheet of paper or a folder and keep that item in there. And so you can see 
that it doesn't change that much over time because it's kept in the right conditions and the right housing. But if you kept the newspaper in, say, a scrapbook that is also made out of acidic paper, then you'll see the deterioration, the flaking, the brittleness, um, the fragility of the item come to pass because those two materials are feeding off of each other. It's like ripening a banana. So if you have a bunch of bananas in a bag together, they're going to ripen faster than if it's a single banana by itself um, or separated from the other fruits. So that's a one example of that. Um, but archival is really a subjective term and they really uh, professional standards such as the American uh, National Studies Institute, they have standards for archival or preservation storage materials that one should look for. And so they really suggest looking at life, expect life expect expectancy of the materials. So these are based on empirical tests. While there are no materials that can meet the ideal definition of archival because many archivists use the term informally to refer to media that can be preserved, preserve information uh, when properly stored for more than 100 years or more. Um, but the use of archival um, products is suitable for the materials and implying an infinite lifespan that has made this use of the word um, not too um, productive for those looking at it. But um, so you should temper that when you're looking for archival materials, you should definitely go to reputable vendors who can back their products up with statistics and empirical tests. Um, so those things you should look at. Um, and these materials should also be used in conjunction with proper environments. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So acid-free, what does that mean? Um, so acid-free storage materials have a pH of around 7, uh, 7.0 or higher. And so it is important to realize that although acid-free materials are not acidic when they are produced, they can become acidic over time um, due to transference, um, the natural um, internal impurities that are introduced during the manufacturing of the materials, external um, impurities such as pollutants and um, which will degrade the, degrade and produce acids. So what is pH? Um, well, um, we all have kind of a general understanding of that, but that just means um, a pH is a measure of acidity or alkalinity or the base um, of a substance and is determined by the concentration of hydrogen ions. And so pH is measured on a scale from zero to 14, values below, 7.0 are acidic and values above 7.0 are alkaline and a pH, a neutral pH is 7.0. So that's natural water. And so what you really want is something 7.0 or above for storing your materials in there. And so these materials that say that they are acid free have a pH of that. And so these um, are typically materials that have been processed and treated to remove any acid. They have um, fibers that are able to last longer, things like that. Um, and acids themselves can be dangerous to materials. Um, so they, they can increase um, acid content over time. They can decrease life expectancy of the item and cause brittleness and yellowing. Um, in, so acids are naturally occurring, um, particularly in organic, inorganic acids are harmful to paper and book, book binding materials. So the adhesives, 
things like that, the leathers that books are bound in. Their presence weakens the holding power of the individual links to the cellulo cellulose chains of the paper, causing brittleness, causing resulting in corrosive effects of some inks, weakenings of some fibers of leather. The source of acid in archival materials may be intrinsic or extrinsic, so they may, may be a part of the natural um, ingredients that create our archival materials. Um, and archival in the sense are the actual materials themselves, the books, the photographs, the maps and things like that. And also the boxes. Um, and then also extrinsic, extrinsic are the forces outside of the control of the materials. So they may be present in the materials due to the manufacture of them um, or the materials that they are made with. Um, or they might be outside of that in the atmosphere. Um, and there's also a concern with housing materials in materials that are not acid free um, and, and also housing acidic items in acid free items. So uh, the foldering of a newspaper article in an acid free folder. So there is acid migration. And so this is the movement of acid from an acidic material to a material of a lesser or no acidity. So either through direct contact or through exposure to acidic vapors in the surrounding environments. And so those are things that over time you may have foldered a bunch of um, newspaper articles or pages from a book or um, house a, a book in a, a phase box or a folder if it's smaller and you can see the yellowing and um, signs of acid mitigation or migration to that item. So then at that point, you need to kind of look at seeing whether or not you want to update that storage for a newer container or folder or box. And so, and there's those types of solutions for those things. But our next term is lignin, um, lignin-free materials. So you'll want to look for materials that have no lignin. Um, lignin is a complex polymer that when left in ground wood pulp leads to embrittlement of the paper created from such pulp. And so, Linden is a natural component, component of the cell of walls of plants and trees. If it is not removed during the manufacture of it, of the paper or paper product, it can react with light and heat to produce acids and darken the paper. Lignin free also, um, so that's the gen general term of what lignin means, but lignin free, actually just means low lignin um, and they typically have a maximum of at least 1% lignin. So there's so, still some of that in there, but it's very minimal. Um, and so you, you won't have that issue for too long. And so you can kind of weigh the pros and cons of that. And since we can't get all the lignin out, um, Lignin-free is kind of the best option for folks interested in those types of materials. So all archival products are lignin-free. Um, so they come in a variety of colors. So most of the vendors that I'll share with you later, they have a variety of colors for their boxes, um, not necessarily for their folders or their envelopes and things like that, but their boxes come in different colors and they have different aspects to them that you can choose from depending on what you're wanting to house. Um, but the only thing that um, to take into consideration is the next slide we'll be talking about unbuffered, but the unbuffered materials will be tan only probably in many cases. And so 
you'll want to look for materials that are avoiding acid and lignin when looking for uh, storage materials. So the terms buffered versus unbuffered. So buffered implies the addition of an alkaline or a calcium carbonate reserve added to storage materials to neutralize acids that may be produced over time. So this is essentially just an additive that is added to the process or the manufacture of whatever item such as folders, boxes, um, the card stock, um, paper that are going to be produced to store materials. So alkaline reserve is usually two to 3% calcium or magnesium carbonate. Most paper collections will require buffered enclosures while an alkaline buffer is buffer in storage enclosures is usually desirable. There are a few types of collections that are sensitive to alkaline materials and should therefore be stored in pH neutral enclosures, not alkaline, so the unbuffered materials. And these materials include blueprints, diazo uh, reproductions, works of art with pigments that react to high pH albums and collages with wool or silk components, or other items that contain animal proteins. So um, medieval manuscripts that are done on vellum and parchment, you do not want to store in buffered materials. So some photographs and textiles may also be alkaline sensitive. So there's lots of resources out there to help you choose the correct product for your storing your materials. So you'll want to look at those. Um, but it's really important that if you're unsure, even just using an unbuffered item, uh, storage container is good to store your item in. It won't have that added benefit of having the calcium um, carbonate reserve, but it's still going to protect your item from dust, light pollution, other environmental concerns. Um, so it just really is there to neutralize the acids and the acid mitigation uh, migration. So then there are the there's the term unbuffered, which that just means that the pH is neutral or simply acid free. And so you'll want to kind of look at both of those things when looking at materials um, to house your items. Then um, we have our photographic activity test. And so this is a standard procedure to check for potential chemical reactions between materials used to make enclosures and photographs stored in enclosures. So these tests are um, performed on paper, board, and plastics, usually required by the manufacturer or seller. It indicates that materials are safe, for use, to, safe to use with photographs. Um, so photographs have a lot of different things that can affect its stability over time and its preservation. And so that comes from the mounting that the photograph is on. So that can be paper, glass, metal, um, plastics, like I said, like, so like negatives, but then there's also the link inks that are used to transfer the image onto the mounting. There's also that chemical process that is used to do that as well. And so you'll really want to um, look at that when you have a large photograph collection to preserve. Um, so we also try and look at um, materials in a sense with standards, but there are no 
There is no one standard that specifically governs the storage of materials for paper objects and or other items, but um, the photographic activity test is a standard test that is used to determine whether an enclosure is safe, um, particularly um, ones with silver image photographs. Um, so you'll really want to look at those standards. And if you're interested in this, there's many organizations that kind of talk about um, things to look at for these types of materials. So that, as I mentioned before, the American National Standards Institute, the National Information Standards Institute, and the International Organization of Standardization, they have come up with a lot of good guidelines um, that are established by a national organization, and they have wide industry standards that also are employed by the National Archives Record and Records Administration and the, the Library of Congress Preservation uh, Directorate. And so those two resources are really good to, to check out too because they'll give good lists of guidelines for preservation of materials. But this is a good basic understanding of kind of what you need to look for and what, how to kind of wrap your head around the word archival and all the things that kind of come with that. So then just a brief discussion of enduring versus permanent value. So the en enduring value means the usefulness or significance of records based on the information that they contain that justifies their permanent or ongoing preservation. So these are kind of things that you want to look at when you are looking for storage materials and how you want to preserve them. So this will give you a sense of how much money you want to spend, what types of materials might be best for the long run, how often do you want to handle these materials, things of net, that nature. Um, and then permanent value is the ongoing usefulness or significance of the records that ju justifies the perpetual um, preservation. So that's looking at it from a research value. So if you're a home archivist um, or a family historian that's wanting to preserve their family archives, you'll have to weigh those different things versus those of us in libraries, museums, and other archives. We have to look at materials a little bit differently. Um, and they have to be of sig significance in those um, respects. So. There's a lot of different things to kind of consider when purchasing materials. Then um, one of the things that we like to talk about is our inherent vices. Um, so these are the inherent vices that are made of the material. So this is what we kind of have to combat when we are choosing housing for specific items. So all materials have natural occurring elements that may speed up decomposition of the item. We can also mitigate this breakdown by preservation and conservation me measures. Thus, that's why we buy boxes and folders to rehouse items. So paper, parchment, vellum, leather, adhesives, colorants, inks, pencils, um, Bindings and reproduction methods all have effects on the items that they create and that they make up. And so we really have to look at those specifically and see what boxes are best. Um, photographs are composite objects, as I was hinting at before. So they consist of a base, which is also called a support. Um, a binding and then an image forming substance. So to produce a photographic image, a light sensitive, light sensitive materials such as silver salts are applied to the support 
made of paper, cloth, plastic, metal, and it's exposed to light. And this forms an either direct visible image known as a printout or a latent image, which is known as a negative or developing out. And this image is fixed in order to remove excess light material and stop the darkening process. Then it is washed to remove the additional fixer. So these are things that you really want to keep in mind when you're looking at storage and how you want to preserve materials. Then we just have inherent um, problematic items. Um, so there are materials that kind of have their own issues, um, such as newspapers um, and some scrapbooks and things like that. So you can see that there's some in inherent vices to these and then also some um, extrinsic, extrinsic vices too. So we have some tape residue um, from someone taping the, the poem inside of a scrapbook to um, newspaper clippings that are pasted into an acidic news uh, scrapbook. And so those are both transferring acid to each other. And so they'll cause um, brittleness, um, potential tears and fragility in the future. Um, so you'll really want to kind of consider these things and make decisions based on the current condition of the item and see where you want to go with that. And so there are ways to mitigate this in addition to choosing the proper storage materials. Um, this includes having um, appropriately sized items, uh, housing for the items themselves, um, the improper environment, so temperature and humidity controls, UV filters, um, any desiccants and hydro uh, hygrometers um, to monitor the temperature and humidity in the room, um, per, uh, perform any repair or conservation needs to the items to remove um, issues so you can if you want um, to preserve the original newspaper. Um, you can make a photocopy of it and then do deacidification treatment to it. Um, you also have to look at adhesive tapes, other papers, board, cloth, erasers, and different tools to help you with this too. And so um, these photos here are a couple different examples. So up in the um, corner, there are, uh, it's a picture of a collection of uniform material, uh, uniforms and textiles. So socks, um, a jacket, some pants, and some metals that came to us in this box in a plastic baggie. Um, and so these materials cannot live in this box. So then we remove them and put them into a uh, archival quality box made from acid-free paper, lignin-free, and then used acid-free tissue paper to protect the items themselves. Then we have an envelope that is in a folder that's acid free. Um, we use mostly unbuffered um, folders just because we do house a lot of uh, photographs in, in folders as well as envelopes and things like that. And it's just an easy way um, to preserve the materials. Then we also have a face box. So this is um, tag board or mat board that we've cut um, to create a unique individual custom box for this volume. So types of enclosures. So what I'm going to do here is to show you a few different types of boxes um, by turning on my screen. But first, I'll just kind of go over um, a basic list. So we have boxes. So box board is fairly thick. And so it should 
stand up to long term use. Um, they do age, um, but it they can be replaced over time. So there's um, a variety of sizes of boxes. Uh, most companies are now offering custom made boxes for um, people to order. Um, there are lots of different features to the box. So there are metal um, hinges on the box that help support the structure and make them last more uh, longer over time. Uh, boxes for long term storage of paper items are available in several different types of boards. They're all acid free, lignin free and buffered um, with 8.0 to 9.0 boxes are also available with polyester film laminate coating, which um, some of these boxes with that coating can resist water damage. So they can, if you have an environment that might potentially have leaking um, pipes or other environmental issues, then you can do that. Um, then we have folder stocks. So these are folder folders that you would think of um, to house papers and things like that. But then there's also just folder stock that you can use to make um, the different variety of enclosures that are unique to the item, including face boxes, things like that. Um, interleaving materials. So these interleaving sheets can be used to um, separate items. That's like tissue, different types of papers, clear polyester film, things like that. So that will create a buffer between items and reduce um, wear and adhesion from those. And then mat boards. So when we're matting and framing artwork, then we can, or mounting con for conservation or um, other things like that, then we can use that too. So I will turn on my screen and show you a few items. So we have this box. And so you can see the corners reinforced. It's a flip top lid. So these ones are really nice because the lid doesn't come off, um, but you'll just have to kind of force them open and keep them open so that um, you can get the folders in and out well. Um, so this is a manuscript box and it's uh, 0.5 um, or 2.5 in um, its size. So it's, it's good for a folder for eight and a half by 11 materials. And then this is a little bit more oversized box. Um, so it's quite large. Um, it's also flip top. And then it also has a little string that you can use to grab the box off of a shelf. Um, so it also has the reinforced um, corners. We have a microfilm box that you can fold. This is acid free. These are really nice because microfilms are um, naturally very acidic. And so they get vinegar syndrome and start decaying. So variety of boxes. So this is a little reel to reel box, or it could be used for a small book, um, a variety of different um, uses for that. We have interleaving paper that is acid free. And then we have our folder. So this is for like eight and a, half, uh, a larger like legal sized folder. Um, for those types of sizes of paper. So if you have an oversized um, item, then you can put in there. Um, so some other examples are envelopes. And so this is an acid-free envelope that we can stick a, a thinner book or magazine, um, photographs, things like that. And as you notice that there's not that much room for this item to move around in. We do have an example of a phase box that we've made. And so this is our phase box. And so this material or this item is constructed specifically for this book. And so you can see it's all one. So there's no tape or anything, but you can make phase boxes with tape as well. And then we can put the label and the barcode on the box instead of on the book. 
then we can also do other things with boards, create a protective housing around an item and then putting string around it to hold it secure. And so this item is protected without making um, a phase box, but a folder stock item that is wrapped around it. And so you'll really wanna choose materials that are suitable to the size of the item is itself too. And so you'll have to do some measuring and then make a best guess. So when, especially with your uh, custom boxes, um, you can send those into Gaylord or any of the art, the, the folks there. Um, then you can also um, use some plastics. So um, the typical ones that you'll run across are polyester, polypropylene, and mylar. Um, so they're, those are the plastics that are stable and won't degrade over time. And so we have a couple um, items that we've enclosed in encapsulation in mylar. We also have this example of a sheet protector made out of thicker um, sheeting, and we use those for our postcards, some photographs that we want to handle more readily. Um, you'll want to avoid PVC or acetate. These are just bad. They will off gas um, and it's just not good for your materials in the long run. Um, and so I'll turn off my screen again for us. And so these, if it smells like plastic, don't use it. Um, polypropylene um, and polyester and poly... Um, Oh goodness, um, polyethylene. Those are those three are the most suitable for storage of items long term, and these should be uncoated and free of additives. And so you can choose the the thickness for the item, depending on what you want to use it for. Um, and so these things should be able to um, be readily apparent when you're looking at the website. Um, so some other considerations when looking at things. So you'll want to um, be cognizant of adhesives when making or looking at housing. So like I said, with the phase boxes, you can make them in one, with one entire sheet without using any tape, but you can also make phase boxes with two pieces of boulder stock that you tape together. So it just depends on what your level of um, skill is when creating the item or what you're comfortable with when um, for whatever item you're housing. And so you'll want to try and remove tape um, try not to use glue that is acidic, um, things like that, especially for mounting. You, If you're creating like a scrapbook for your um, special collections or your library's archives, try and use photo corners instead of mounting it with glue or tape, things like that. Um, and then remove um, other plastics that you can't readily test um, so that those things don't uh, transfer the, the acid or damage the items further. So where do you purchase these materials? So there's a, there are a variety of places, but these ones um, we've all used. Um, so we use mostly Gaylord Archival, Hollinger Metal Edge, University Products, and sometimes Archival Products, and sometimes Talus. So they all have... Um, Similar items, but they all have pros and cons. Um, sometimes you can get a discount at Gaylord, but you can also find really good products at University Products. Um, archival Products is a locally um, owned archival store in Iowa. Hollinger Metal Edge has a lot of great products as well, Broad Art. As two does two, so it's just kind of your personal preference, what you're willing to spend for a 
particular item and what they have in stock. So you might find an item that you like at Gaylord, but for one item and then university products might have a enclosure or box for another item. But um, I just would like to thank you all for spending your time with us. And if you have any questions, you can email us, you can phone us at our phone number, and we have a variety of websites that you can check out and please follow us on our social media. And thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank you.